Jacob and Heather met Sharon and me. Um, where were we? Was it the little con here in Greenville? Uh, Monster Con. Monster Con. And then it wasn't. In, it wasn't actually in Greenville. It was. Um, oh, yeah, it was Seneca. Like Thirty minutes away. I yeah. I honestly don't remember where. But it was. It was. It was a small affair. It was in a library. I think. Wasn't it associated with a library? Ah, uh, I thought it was like a school gym or something. Anyway, but it was. Yeah. You know, I hate to say this, but when you have done thirty years worth of conventions, they kind of blur a little bit. I can imagine. Yeah, I, I have trouble remembering what I had for dinner yesterday. Sometimes, so, yeah. Anyway, um, so Heather and, and Jacob were there, and uh, Heather had just, was recovering from surgery. Mm -hmm. Yep. Yeah, they, she had the the uh, uh, the lymph node biopsy, mm -hmm. and so her muscles were recovering, and I was. You know, holding out my arm, and she was hobbling around because she was having a severe case of cabin fever at the time. You have to know Heather. <laughs> <laughs> I'm guessing that she watched all the anime there was. <laughs> oh, she 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 wanted to get out the house, and, and uh, I mean, I was literally still like holding out my arm so she could lower herself onto the sofa, oh, yeah. or, or pick herself up. Sharon and I have been through that a time or three. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm like, I don't, I don't know if you, it's like, I want, I want to go out. I want to go out. I want to go to this convention. It's like, I don't know. I, I don't know. Maybe, maybe you should just take it easy. Let your muscles heal. It's like, David Weber will be there. You can get your, your book signed. One of the books. And I, I get out this old dog-eared copy of In Death Ground. and like, <laughs> okay, okay, she wins. <laughs> <laughs> Hit me, beat me, make me write bad checks. Yeah, I'll go. <laughs> uh, but anyway, so the the uh, he they turned up and we signed the book and we got to talking. Um, I can't believe that I was like just talking to somebody I just met. I mean, you know, uh, I told you about the girls asked me one time come across the Bible parking lot and I was speaking to this talk 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 this guy we'd never met. And one of the girls said, "Dad, did you ever meet anybody you didn't stop to talk to?" And I said. Sure, back in 1978, there was this guy passed him on the street, never said a word. <laughs> you know, they were like, okay, Dad, sure. No. Anyway, so we got to talking, um, and we really liked them, and uh, we had uh, we had uh, dinner together um, at Ruby Tuesdays, yep. which is now defunct, mm -hmm. um, and uh, we started sort of sort of hanging. Okay, and I knew that Jacob had done uh, some uh, uh, solo, um, uh, self-published indies, mm -hmm. um, and uh, I'd read uh, two of them. Um, and so I was, there were two things going on from my perspective, well, three actually. Um, one thing that was going on was that I had decided that I really liked Jacob a lot. Um, the other, the second thing that was going on was that there was, there was part of the whole, there are stories I want to tell that I don't have time to tell thing. And in particular, there was one story that I had wanted to do, what became the Gordian Protocol, um, that I knew what I needed the story to do. But I hadn't really thought through what I needed the tech to do to make the story happen. Okay, mm -hmm. uh, and so I asked Jacob if he would be interested in in working me on. He said, "Oh crap, I am. I'm I don't know about me." You know, I said, "Yeah, you know, more or less." <laughs> well, little did David know at the time, uh, I had once swore sworn to myself that I would never, ever write a time travel novel. Make no rash promises. <laughs> <laughs> so, so you know, David Weber says, hey, I think we should uh, write a collaboration together, and this is the story I think we should tell. I'm like, yes, David, I think that's a wonderful <laughs> he idea. He didn't say, wait, a time travel story. <laughs> hey, listen, I swore I would never write a conspiracy theory of history novel, and then I wrote Mutineer's Moon. <laughs> Okay, which is kind of the ultimate conspiracy theory of history, you know, that kind of thing. So you don't get no sympathy from me on that. <laughs> I'm not looking for sympathy. <laughs> <laughs> but the um, basically, <clears throat> Rob, uh, when 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 Jake and I are working together, um, 
I think maybe of all the collaborations that I've done, we interlock the best in our area in our areas of strength. Okay, um, I'm the more experienced writer, and I think at this point I still have a better ear for for style and for smoothing narrative and dialogue. And I'm the historian in the time travel stories. Okay. Mm -hmm. Jacob has a really good background on the hard side of the technology. He's the guy who actually designed the technology for the 30th century. You told me later, you said, man, I was freaking going to have to throw at least half of that out. And you were like, go. <laughs> yeah. I was, I was like, okay. And now I, we, I know you said before he actually designed two different. Yeah. Uh, well, I, did, I, I designed what I needed the societies to be. Mm -hmm. And then Jacob designed how they came to be that. Okay. Do you see what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. And they're both, you know, it's kind of like you can't have one without the other. Okay. I could have come up with a really strong, but I need these guys to be. And if the tech wasn't there, it wouldn't be sustainable for the reader. Jacob could have come up with really good tech for the societies. But if it didn't have the underpinning social structure, then the same problem would have been true from the other side. Do you see what mm -hmm, I'm saying? Mm -hmm. Either one of us might have been able to carry it off alone, but combined, we kind of filled in those spaces, and I think it worked. It worked very well. Okay. Now we are having a little bit of a of a discussion over just how post scarcity a post scarcity economy is, <laughs> um, because I'm, uh, you know, it's like, okay, but. This, he's kind of like, but the logical implications of the technology, I'm saying, but the logical problem of that for the storytelling. Is, um, and and it's, a, it's kind of a, it comes with the territory when you're going to write science fiction, especially science fiction that has the, the kind of tech base that we're looking at. I mean, really sophisticated with, you know, they can print stuff down to the, the atomic level. Uh, they have all kinds of nanotech. They have counter gravity. They have self-aware AI. They have artificial individuals running around, you know, kind of mm -hmm. thing. Um, the problem that you get into is kind of what Larry Niven got into um, when he, he, he basically had created a technology. He couldn't give his characters a problem they couldn't fix because their technological capabilities were mm -hmm. so great. Um, and it's kind of like uh, my favorite example uh, from uh, TV is the transporter in the Enterprise, which they had to keep breaking because otherwise, well, there's the answer to the problem. We'll just you know, be right over there, and, you know. Uh, we'll we'll or we'll replicate it, you know. It'll be okay, you know. Um, so the um, there's 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 one line in particular where Jacob said, well, "Okay." Uh, and I gave you that one. <laughs> you gave me that I, one. That's true. I, and that's I, true. That's and true. I, I fully understood why you yeah. wanted to be there. I just put in the in the comments as we went back and forth a rather lengthy description <laughs> on why I thought it was slightly inaccurate. <laughs> well, okay. Are you familiar with Clark's law, which says that any sufficiently advanced technology is indistinguishable from magic? Okay. okay. I mean, if you think about what we're doing right this minute, and then you went back to the 13th century right. and tried to explain it to somebody, they'd be like, you know, we got this stake down in the middle of town. <laughs> you know, you'll lie there. You know, uh, such a view you'll have. You know. um, but the, the, the problem is that you still have to have in the storytelling component, you still have to have problems that you can make. It's why I say over and over again at cons and on panels that what your characters can do is less important than what your characters can't do because it's what they can't do that creates the problems. Mm -hmm. um, and um, so far we've done a pretty fair job um, with handing our characters things that they can't do anyway despite their technology. Sometimes we have to do it by breaking the transporter like uh, with the shadow. Okay, mm -hmm. basically, if our, if our bunch of uh, rogue time travelers in the Valkyrie Protocol had been able to get back to where they were going with a functional TTV, the game would have been over. Okay, so we had to break the TTV <laughs> on the way back. Um, and it works. 
it works. It's it it makes sense. It fits the storyline and it creates the the conflict and the the problems that we needed them to have. But it did mean that we had to break the TTV. Um, and uh, so you, you kind of have, that That can be a problem, especially when you have such a well thought out technological background, because a well thought out robust technology is going to have workarounds for the problems that you present, present them to. Okay. Mm-hmm. And if you have an intelligent readership, they're going to say, but look, they could have just done blah, 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 blah. And the response says, yes, and then there would have been no novel. <laughs> <You know? True. laughs> uh, which is not the best response possible, you know. <laughs> <laughs>